Students, it's an exciting new semester, and I feel honored to teach you a whole bunch of new general chemistry. For my students who are actually taking this course from me, you might notice looking at our course schedule that there are a few chapters in the second half of our text that I'm intentionally skipping. I want you to understand that the reason I'm skipping is not because they're unimportant. The reason I'm skipping them is because I don't have enough time to cover them. Why don't I have enough time? Well, during the last four weeks of this semester's coverage of general chemistry, what I'm going to do is a systematic review of all of the topics that we've covered over the entire year in general chemistry to help prep you for the final exam, which is a standardized American Chemical Society exam. It's rather beautiful, actually. But that's just the point. In order to be able to do that systematic review, I do not have time to cover every single chapter. So I sort of have to pick and choose and exclude a couple of chapters. Rest assured, though, you chemistry students of mine, that you have my complete and full encouragement to read those chapters on your own just for fun. With that business out of the way, let's get started with a hilarious quick meme mocking college freshmen. For you who are college freshmen, please don't take any permanent offense. This, of course, comes from quickmeme.com. This college freshman, it says, My first chem exam is tomorrow? I did fine in high school without studying. 12 out of 100. This next one, I'm so poor, ramen, lol. Has iPhone, MacBook, and wears Abercrombie. Let's go into today's lineup. After this presentation, which will cover sections 1 through 3 of chapter 13, you should be able to do the following. First, define entropy and understand its contribution to spontaneous processes. Define the following terms, solute, solvent, solvation, miscible, and immiscible. Predict whether certain solutes and solvents will be miscible or immiscible in each other. Think that crystallization of saturated solutions is really cool. And use equation 13.4 called Henry's Law to interrelate concentration and pressure. That's the lineup. Let's get started by first discussing the solution process. According to our book, a solution is formed when one substance disperses uniformly throughout another. In this chapter, we'll be talking about how this occurs. Nearly all systems, including reaction systems, solutions, my kids' bedrooms, and even civilizations, seem to have a natural tendency to spontaneously become more disordered. In the world of science, disorder is called entropy. Thus, we say that systems spontaneously drift toward higher entropy, or increased disorder. You may remember us talking in the past about enthalpy, or delta H. When delta H is negative, you should remember, a reaction is exothermic. Exothermic processes are energetically favorable, and therefore generally tend to occur spontaneously. In some cases, however, endothermic processes can also occur spontaneously, thanks to entropy. In other words, some processes that are endothermic energetically disfavored will still occur spontaneously if they are accompanied by a large increase in entropy or disorder. An example of this is the melting of ice, which is an endothermic process. You should note that, of course, because when you hold ice in your hand and watch it melt, it's cold. It's sucking heat out of your hand and into itself. Thus, it's endothermic. It doesn't produce heat. It consumes heat. Nevertheless, that spontaneously occurs at room temperature. Why does it occur at room temperature? The reason is because of entropy. The individual ice molecules that are solidified water at room temperature want to become more disordered. And as they convert from a solid to a liquid, indeed they do. This brings us to a beautiful lecture problem. Formation of solutions where the process is endothermic can still be spontaneous provided that blank. I'll let you see if you can figure out the answer to this on your own. I now want to introduce you to some very, very important vocabulary for this chapter. Here they are. Solute is the component that is present in a lesser amount in a solution. Solvent is the component that is present in a greater amount in a solution. Solvation is the interaction between solvents and solutes in a solution. To solvate something means to dissolve it. And lastly is the word miscible. When two liquids dissolve completely in each other, we say they are miscible. Two liquids that do not dissolve in each other, like oil and water, for example, are said to be immiscible. 
Now, a solute's ability to dissolve in a solvent depends largely upon, first, how strong the intermolecular forces are that bind the solute molecules to each other. The stronger they are, the more difficult it is for solvents to break them apart. Second, how strong the intermolecular forces are between the solute and the solvent as well. Now, the stronger these are, the easier it is for the solvent to dissolve the solute. We can see these two principles clarified in the following diagram. If I, for example, take sodium chloride, table salt, depicted in this figure here where the chloride ions are green and the sodium cations are purple, you can imagine throwing sodium chloride into water, these uh, red and white molecules surrounding it. Water has specific intermolecular forces, in particular hydrogen bonding, that keeps the water molecules clustered together. In order to dissolve a crystal of sodium chloride, I have to break apart the intermolecular forces, that is, the hydrogen bonds between those water molecules, and have those intermolecular forces start to interact with the ions in the sodium chloride. Secondly, I also have to have the individual intermolecular forces, the ion-ion attractions between the sodiums and chlorides, break apart as well. So in effect, I have to overcome two energy barriers, breaking apart water molecules' intermolecular forces, and then breaking apart the sodium chloride's interionic forces. Then I get the payoff, which is the energetically favorable interaction between the water molecules and each of the sodium cations, as well as separate water molecules and the chloride anions. We can say then that the solution process has three delta H or enthalpy components. First, the delta H of separating apart the solute molecules from each other, which we call delta H solute. Second, the delta H of separating the solvent molecules from each other, which we'll call delta H solvent. And third, the delta H of mixing the solute and solvent particles back together again. Hence, the entire delta H for the whole process of dissolving a solute in a solvent, which we can call delta H soln, which is an abbreviation for solution, can be depicted using the following equation. Delta H of solution is equal to delta H of solute plus delta H of solvent plus delta H mix. I'll go ahead and take this equation and throw it up top. I want you to take a look at this equation and make sure you understand what each of the components means. Now that we have it on the screen, I want you to understand a few things. First, breaking particles apart always consumes energy. Hence, delta H solute, that is the enthalpy of breaking apart solute molecules, and delta H solvent, which is the enthalpy of breaking apart solvent molecules from each other, are always positive or endothermic. Delta H mix, however, that is the uh, energetically favorable interaction of the solvent and solute molecules with each other after they've been broken apart, is always negative or exothermic. The reason is because it represents the energy given off when these solvent and solute molecules come together. And coming together is always good. Please remember that while breaking molecules apart always consumes energy, getting molecules back together always gives off energy. That said, delta H solution then could either be positive endothermic or negative exothermic, depending on what the individual values of delta H solute, delta H solvent, and delta H mix are. Does that make sense? I hope so. As an aside, please remember that endothermic processes still can proceed spontaneously if they're accompanied by a large enough increase in entropy or disorder. I'd now like to end by sharing some cool examples from our book. In our book, it mentions that magnesium sulfate, when it's dissolved in water, is an exothermic process. I should know because I've done it tons, and it totally gives off heat. In contrast, dissolving ammonium nitrate in water is endothermic. These two salts, then, magnesium sulfate and ammonium nitrate, are the major salts used in hot and cold packs, respectively. The packs contain a pouch of water in one section, separated from the solid salts in another. When you squeeze the pouch, it breaks the seal between the two. The two mix, and then the temperature change ensues. That takes us to the end of this lecture. I hope it's been fun for you. Please stay tuned for the next one, in which I'll continue teaching you about the chemistry of solvation, solutes dissolving in solvents. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.